Uh, I'm Adam Posen, president of the Pearson Institute for International Economics. And I think I want to praise my colleagues sitting to my left and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for recognizing the economic component of the alliance with so much excitement and change going on on the security side with so much sentiment behind it and so many obvious issues, there is a tendency sometimes to forget that most of the time we are also working on an economic common purpose. Obviously, TPP brings that to the fore, and that is, uh, we hope, going to be part of Prime Minister Abe's remarks in a few minutes. Um, and so I've been delighted at Peterson Institute to work with Sasakawa Peace Foundation and Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA with Professor Ito and numerous leading Japanese and American economists on a program about the U.S.-Japan common economic challenges that the two foundations have supported. But today you're here to hear from very important former and influential officials about the role of TPP in the alliance moving forward and at this critical juncture for Japan and the U.S. and how we can use or take advantage of Prime Minister Abe's visit and speech in the context of the TPP discussion, why it's so important. We have three extraordinarily well-informed and, as I said, influential speakers. You have their full bios here. I'm just going to first introduce, uh, I'll introduce each and then ask the speakers to go. Former Senator Richard Lugar, uh, longtime chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, one of the wise men, if you'll allow the phrase, of American foreign policy and one of the great advocates of a bipartisan American foreign policy, will give us some opening remarks on his vision of how TPP fits in. Sitting next to him is Dr. Michelle Flournoy, who is president of the Center for New American Security. Um, she, of course, has had a distinguished career both inside and outside the U.S. Defense Department as an advisor to successive U.S. presidents, including as Under Secretary of Defense in the early part of the Obama administration, and remains at the core. Uh, I would say wise men, I don't want to play gender games. She plays uh -huh. that role as well at this point, although she's still young enough to <laughs> do active things as well. And on the left, most seat for me is my colleague and dear friend Takatoshi Ito, professor of economics and international mm -hmm. business at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, following on a long and distinguished career as perhaps the best known Japanese macroeconomist in the world, uh, visiting professorships including at Harvard where I first met him, uh, and a long career at Todai at University of Tokyo. He remains one of the most influential outside advisors to both Prime Minister Abe and the Cabinet and the Bank of Japan. So to get to substance, I would like to ask Senator Lugar to give us his opening remarks, either from the podium or seated as he pleases. I guess that's the podium. I can move <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is truly a wonderful time in, in the relationships between the United States and Japan. Uh, I understand it was not some big coincidence that brought us all together at the same time the distinguished Prime Minister of Japan was in Washington and maybe at this very moment is addressing a joint session of the Congress. And I'm so pleased that that is occurring and I understand he may address each one of you later on today. But uh, in this context, I want to recall that uh, in 2012, uh, some of us, at least on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, became aware that uh, there was something called a pivot to Asia in our foreign policy. I mention this because, um, unfortunately, uh, perhaps this was the fault of the committee, we had really very little information about the pivot. The idea was, uh, generally, as we heard from sometimes informal conversations with the administration, that the United States had been preoccupied with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and the Middle East generally, and maybe many other subjects. And there was a feeling that perhaps uh, we had neglected Asia. There was at least a feeling that we ought to become more involved in ASEAN and in APEC. 
and as a matter of fact, began to play much more of a role. So as a part of that situation, I took a, a trip when I was still in the Senate in the, in the late summer 2012, starting in Honolulu with our United States Pacific Command. to ask them what the pivot was all about. Well, they were very, very helpful. They had, uh, from a military standpoint, a very comprehensive view of their activities and the expansion of those activities. They, as a matter of fact, uh, suggested that uh, on my way to Asia, I stop at Guam and uh, take a look at some developments there. They, they were modest, but it was apparent that uh, there were more Americans on Guam. There were buildings that were being built more people in a modest hotel there. Uh, in essence, the thought was that um, on the way to Asia, this was a stopping point, and uh, one at least uh, that had played a role already in America's specific policy, and would be playing a much larger role. Well, we uh, were reinforced by ideas there and uh, moved on to the Philippines. Uh, that was uh, even more exciting because the USS George Washington was in the harbor at that time, there were in the hotel in which I stayed in Manila a good number of American sailors. And they were being uh, greeted very warmly by uh, Filipinos who had an opportunity to shake hands with them. Some of the sailors had some relationships in the Philippines, as it turned out. But um, it was very, very interesting uh, to note what the USS George Washington meant. The thought that this giant aircraft carrier was cruising the area, was in fact uh, available, apparently, to be of assistance to Filipinos. It was uh, an exciting moment to be on Clark Air Force Base, no longer Air Force Base, just Clark Base. Uh, that had changed a while back, but there were some who were suggesting it might change again with uh, all sorts of new enterprises all around there. Uh, we moved on to, um, to Thailand, an interesting visit there, much less regarding the pivot, uh, but, uh, and then to Indonesia. Uh, there, uh, the, the president uh, and the parliament people with whom I met were especially pleased that uh, the United States was paying more attention to them. I asked just out of curiosity, how many visits do you have from United States senators? And they said, well, about one a year. But they couldn't remember at least when the last one had come. Uh, in essence, they wanted more attention. Uh, and they were very pleased that uh, the pivot might mean more attention, although it was not altogether clear how that would work out. And of course, uh, we visited Japan. And uh, there, in the post-nuclear uh, disaster situation, uh, there were very, very friendly people to all of our military personnel, as well as the civilians, as we visit uh, various posts around the country, um, we began to gather at least a feeling that the United States was appreciated, was welcomed, and it was not at all clear at that point exactly what roles we would play, although as I've mentioned, ASEAN and APEC and activities there already were beginning to invigorate the relationship. Now I want to mention that um, there is a situation that has developed since that time, in which um, obviously uh, there are others that are deeply interested in our being in the, the area. I don't want to uh, make this uh, a, a very pointed remark with regard to Japan, or rather to China, but um, we understand that while the conversation is going on in the Congress right now, and likewise with Japanese parliamentarians with regard to the TPP Treaty, there are, of course, other alternatives available to nations. The United States is perhaps somewhat surprised that as many as 57 nations signed up for a Chinese bank that is perhaps going to come to some type of chartering, I understand, in June. Uh, about the same time as it's hoped that uh, TPP might be reaching maturity and at least uh, passage by the Congress and by appropriate officials in, in Japan. There, there is um, a hope, certainly, at this particular juncture 
that uh, Americans will understand, that is, the broad specter of American citizens, in addition to those in Congress, what is at stake, and this is a part of our discussion this morning on the strategic aspects of this. The United States uh, leadership in this business is at stake. Uh, make no bones about it. We have invested as a country about five years in negotiating this treaty. Uh, it has been up and down and back and forth, and um, many of the same situations of opposition have been there all along. The automobile industry, I would say in particular, has been vocal, uh, but uh, they are not alone. Uh, very clearly on the Japanese side, we have always understood that agricultural interests were very much involved in the discussion, uh, but uh, they, those were not alone either. There is uh, increasingly a, a desire on the part of some members of Congress to, to come into the discussion rather late in the game. I was disappointed to learn that uh, Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, for example, who I've heard give excellent speeches from his uh, standpoint as trade representative of the United States about the importance of this treaty, uh, coming forward with uh, perhaps an amendment or certainly discussion of how you can stop currency manipulation. This has clearly been a part of our controversies with China in the past as we claimed that the Chinese were changing the value of their currency to make uh, their trade objectives more viable, sometimes changing it very dramatically. But we're in a world now, as all of you have observed, in which uh, currencies of many nations are changing vis-a-vis -vis the dollar or each other, largely uh, because of turmoil in uh, some countries in Europe facing potential bankruptcy or something very close to that, uh, as well as even some decline in the rate of growth of China, which is affected from time to time daily reports in our stock market. Uh, so um, as a result uh, of all of this, um, the, the currency manipulation amendment uh, is, is one that is not simply the old protectionist adage of labor unions and automobile companies in the United States uh, or rice farmers uh, or others in uh, uh, really trying to, to forestall pork and beef uh, exports to Japan. Um, perhaps uh, these groups may finally come to some degree of compromise or understanding. But the point, at least uh, uh, our panel, at least uh, my part of it, is to say that uh, they had better. Uh, President Obama was very, very direct in remarks that he's made in the last 48 hours about uh, this, this trade treaty. He's in essence uh, indicating that uh, the leadership of the United States is at stake that there are other avenues for countries to pursue, not just bilateral agreements, but uh, multilateral agreements that are options for countries that do not include them in the United States. There are, are some Americans, perhaps, who have never been involved in trade issues, who have never quite understood the development of wealth, even sometimes state by state, quite apart from nationally, uh, but we're, we're coming to a time in which we're going to become educated or we're going to lose ground, uh, and a lot of it. It's interesting that uh, even while this debate goes on, there are missions by governors of various states in the United States uh, to China and uh, to Japan and to other countries in which they are trying to gain business investment in their states. They understand the jobs issue which uh, simply crowds out many others in terms of our politics. Now, the jobs issue is a very sophisticated dilemma because some would point out that uh, as the United States and other countries have become uh, more used to mechanical devices or new communication <coughs> devices or the internet or so forth, a lot of people have been crowded out of jobs already who did not have the qualifications for these sophisticated uh, employment situations. Uh, furthermore, there are many persons at uh, the other end of the spectrum who have never had adequate education and are simply uh, left at the starting gate. The jobs issue is a very critical one in our politics 
as well as in the, that of other nations. But the, the data very clearly for the United States in terms of trade treaties in which we have been involved uh, shows, as I'm certain you all know, extraordinary gains both ways for the countries we've dealt with as the ones we ha don't have. Now the problem now is not just simply jobs, and that is very, very important, but as the president pointed out accurately, and many of you have, it is a question of national security or international security, security uh, in Asia, security for countries that are concerned about uh, Chinese inroads in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, or specifically islands being built out of sand, being heaped together, or other islands that are not being built around the Philippines, for example, that uh, seem to be in dispute as to who is in charge. Um, these are not new issues. The Senkaku Islands problem uh, certainly has been there for quite a long while, but it's, it's certainly a very virile now. Uh, it is a situation in which um, the relationship between the United States and China between Japan and China, uh, between uh, South Korea and China, and so forth, uh, is evolving. And we must make certain it stays on course. So that, as a matter of fact, there are gains for all of the nations involved. And yet, at the same time, uh, the United States' uh, role in Asia is going to increase. The United States fleet is still the only one that uh, is able to sail in all the oceans of the, of the earth, the only one that could hopefully keep various sea lanes open, uh, hopefully not by force in some cases in the Middle East or in Asia, but uh, that would be a possibility. We will continue to maintain that fleet. Even the warship aspects that I suggested from time to time, floating around for six months before taking leave for six months. Uh, these will be important parts of the pivot. But at the same time, uh, it is simply critical to our understanding today that the United States decision has to be positive or the loss of confidence, of leadership on the part of our country, and finally, therefore, real problems of national security for the United States as well as for our allies are going to be very present. And those who are opposing the treaty uh, must come to that understanding. Now, uh, it, it may very well be in our debates in the United States, as witnessed by others, there does not seem to have been much of a preoccupation with foreign policy or, or security policy. Um, very clearly, there will need to be much more. I'm grateful, for example, that uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Bob Corker has come forward as a new leader, uh, has uh, pulled together in a bipartisan way with Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland, uh, so that uh, there is potential for the fast track authority that uh, our president would need in order to negotiate the final elements of a TPP treaty. Um, the fast track business is not completed, uh, not out of the woods, but nevertheless it has gone a lot further than many people would have predicted even a month ago. Uh, there is, with the leadership of the president, a very concerted effort. But it comes at a time in our political time in which uh, it is going to be very difficult for many persons in Congress or those who are contenders for the presidential nomination to buy all of this. I don't really want to delve into our politics today while we're talking about the strategic situation, but uh, uh, certainly uh, President Obama has been very tactful in sort of walking around the positions uh, taken recently by Hillary Clinton, for example, who as Secretary of State was very much in favor of TPP. Still is not opposed to it, but at the same time perhaps recognizes one of the great hurdles that she has for the Democratic nomination, given the strong opposition of so many Democratic legislators, uh, as well as uh, Mr. Trump of LCIO and others, that this is a potential hazard. Um, likewise, uh, there are persons uh, who just simply have typically opposed all treaties, and uh, they are still there. Whether, as a matter of fact, uh, the votes can be assembled and in what form, 
Uh, that remains to be seen. But this conference is extremely timely because it emphasizes that if the United States does not come forward, we are going to be left out, left out uh, at a time in which our leadership was required, both for our own security and by allies who really want us to be a part of a specific situation, as well as those in the 12 member group who are not in the specific area in South America and Canada and so forth, who really count upon that worldwide leadership. Those 12 nations, as you've all heard, encompass 40% of trade already, and that is very likely to grow much more toward 50 if we are successful, uh, with all of the consequent uh, increases, at least in, in prosperity. I, I, I appreciate uh, very much the timeliness of the conference but the opportunity once again to emphasize the necessity of the United States from a strategic security standpoint to move ahead with the, uh, uh, the treaty, move ahead with the fast track authority very quickly to expedite that, to do the very best job we can in, in bringing at least some solace to some farm groups in Japan and to automobile dealers and maybe some farmers also in the United States this is a diplomatic task that lies ahead of us, but not an impossible one, given the dangerous world in which we live. I thank each one of you for your stewardship and your leadership. It is an honor to be a part of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Flournoy, yeah. Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to... Um, Thanks, Senator Luger, for his very cogent and compelling strategic case for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Because TPP is not just a trade agreement. Uh, it's not just a trade issue. It is, as you described, sir, a strategic issue for the United States uh, in Asia Pacific. There is no region that is more important to US security and prosperity in the next generation, even the next 50 years, than the Asia Pacific. This was the fundamental uh, insight that really drove the policy of the pivot or the rebalance. And I apologize that you didn't hear about it till 2012 <laughs> properly in terms of having administration officials come and brief you on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But, but you know, the question that the president had asked at the time was, you know, as we draw down in Iraq, as we can see a conclusion to the war in Afghanistan in a proactive way, you know, where should the United States place its strategic focus? Where is um, that you know, next major strategic opportunity? And all of the arrows pointed towards the Asia Pacific. The real challenge in Asia is how do you maintain and adapt a rules-based international order um, that, um, that is really uh, uh, supportive of our interests and values, those of our allies and partners. Um, we architected the order uh, that, that is, uh, has defined uh, uh, interactions in Asia, that has laid the foundation of stability and tremendous economic prosperity. We have a great interest in seeing that rules-based international order sustained um, uh, going forward. And yet, when you look at the actions of a rising China, Beijing seems determined to reshape that order through unilateral steps, such as uh, to try to change the status quo, whether it's the ADIZ, whether it's uh, the activities in the South China Sea, as was mentioned, the creation of new islands that didn't exist, the use of coercive measures to stake claims on disputed territories. Um, and China is also moving forward to create competing institutions like the Asian Inf Infrastructure Investment Bank that operate on a different set of rules, rules that are going to be written by China and rules that lack the kind of high standards that the U.S. seeks in its trade deals, in its dealings with international financial institutions, and so forth. So in this context, TPP has really become the number one symbol and metric 
of U.S. continued commitment to and leadership in the region. Passing TPP, uh, or concluding it and, 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 and ratifying it, would send a powerful message of U.S. staying power and engagement in the region, um, U.S. leadership in economic as well as the security domain, um, and it would be a huge reassurance to our allies and our partners who are eager to have the United States stay engaged uh, as the underwriter of those rules of the road. If there's no TPP, it's very important that we are realistic and clear-eyed about the detrimental uh, consequences for U.S. interests. As Senator Luger said, it, there would, this would be a tremendous blow to U.S. leadership in the region at a time, frankly, when there are doubts about our staying power. It would engender a loss of confidence uh, among our allies and our partners who want us to be fully engaged. And it would, I think, unfortunately, fuel the erroneous narrative of U.S. decline. You know, I say erroneous because by any objective measure, the U.S. is not in decline. But there is that narrative out there because of some of the dysfunction in Washington. Um, if we can't see our way to doing the right thing when our strategic interests are at stake, that narrative will be further uh, amplified. In addition, others, most again, most notably China, uh, will step into the breach. They will provide alternatives um, that either exclude the U.S. or provide less favorable terms uh, to U.S. businesses, labor, and our other interests, whether it's um, lower labor standards, poor environmental standards, failure to protect intellectual property, failure to secure an open um, and free internet, and the, and the list goes on. If it becomes, if, if that were to become, if a, the, the, uh, an alternative set of rules were to become the model for the fastest growing region in the world, it would not only put U.S. firms and workers at a significant disadvantage, it will result in American markets being carved up, in American firms being excluded from the supply chains, in de decreasing our linkages to key allies, and overall you know, seeing our influence diminished. Um, Eighty years ago, Franklin Roosevelt um, asked the New Deal Congress for the first grant of trade negotiating authority. And when he asked for that, he said, quote, the world does not stand still. Uh, that same, we should remember that today. If there's no TPP, Asia will not stand still. It will move on without us. And that would mean a vast reduction in the US ability to benefit from trade with the most dynamic uh, region of the world, which accounts for more than 40% of global GDP and a third of global trade. Um, if we were to pass TPP, this, I believe, would be very beneficial for the U.S. economy. It would continue to fuel our economic recovery. And I also believe it would help to restore the fiscal health, uh, uh, our fiscal health, and potentially set the conditions to reverse what I believe have been damaging cuts to our own defense spending. It's imperative that we have the wherewithal and the political will to invest in the military capabilities we are going to need in the future in a highly complex and volatile environment. Um, and I believe this agreement would help to set us up to do that. It would also help the economies of our closest allies and partners, Japan, Australia, others, um, and enable them to contribute more to our collective security in the region. So there's really no more step, uh, no step that's more important to sustaining the rebalance, to sustaining U.S. engagement and leadership in this critical region than TPP. The stakes are very, very high. Um, let me just conclude by saying, you know, for years our strategic ob objectives have been supported by our economic and commercial connections in this region. Strong trade agreements preserve the support 
and would prevent a long-term shift in our economic influence, um, a shift away from the United States that would strengthen the hand of other players. If we want the U.S. to remain a major economic and strategic force in the region, if we want U.S. companies and exporters to be leading um, the leading commercial players, if we want regional initiatives that reflect U.S. interest and values, if we want high standards, uh, uh, international dealings, international institutions, we have to keep the United States at the heart of uh, what's happening in this region. And there is no better way to do that than supporting TPP. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Professor Ito. Thank you. Um, I'm an economist, as Adam uh, uh, introduced me, and probably Adam and I are only two economists in this uh, big room. <laughs> it's not often that I get invited to the security uh, conference, and ever since I got an invitation from the Sasaka Peace Foundation that I was thinking about relationship between uh, security and economy, and obvious connection. Um, then I remembered my uh, uh, old joke uh, among the economists, and I don't know whether this goes well in, uh, among the security uh, experts, but the, um, so Gorbachev was observing the uh, military parade in the Red Square, and uh, the rockets and tanks and so on, that's the end. There was a band of um, black suits, uh, tie, with briefcase, and he turned to the aide and, who are they? And the aide said, oh, it is a, a brigade of the economists, sir. And uh, we send them as economic advisor to enemy country, and they're very good at <laughs> destroying the country. <laughs> so um, that's a joke. And so, <laughs> so obviously, uh, economy gets stronger and bigger, then uh, uh, the country has a temptation to become more assertive. Country becomes weaker, then cannot afford to, uh, to uh, engage in, in the um, uh, arms race. And um, um, that's, that's uh, I think, well established in the history. Now, um, if, if the country is, uh, is big and um, uh, imports from all other countries, then uh, other countries are dependent on one this big country. And this big, one big country can be sort of um, um, assertive or set a rule and um, uh, other countries cannot respond because they are afraid of losing uh, the market, right? So this one big country used to be, for a long time, the US. I think the EU tries to become establish that uh, status um, only halfway. And in Asia, the China is rising to, to that status. And all other countries are afraid of losing the market in China so that they sort of accommodate what China does. I think that's the uh, connection uh, between the economy and security. Um, so um, the bilateral dependence is always good in promoting a cooperation and not, uh, uh, not one uh, country dominates uh, the other. I think the inside European countries, Eurozone, is built on that idea that mutual dependence will promote peace. Um, now TPP, right? So we economists always uh, uh, endorse a free trade. I think we, we unanimously, economists, disagree all the time, but you know, economists unanimously endorse that free trade is good thing. And um, uh, those um, uh, international division of labor, or what we call comparative uh, advantage, is um, a win-win situation. Now, uh, WTO has been uh, promoting those free trade in the multilateral uh, uh, framework, but now we are sort of the uh, pursuing those regional arrangements 
But um, I think the TPP in the Asia Pacific and uh, TTIP, the uh, US and the EU, and Japan is negotiating Japan, EU. If all those three uh, regional arrangements are done uh, successfully, then uh, this is almost uh, like WTO. It's a really building block for those multilateral relations. And I think the TPP is very important to be concluded first so that other two big uh, FDA uh, will be uh, concluded. Also, it is very important to have the so-called high standard FDA that is uh, tariffs to be as close to, to as close as zero and um, harmonizing uh, regulations and lower, lowering the uh, non-tariff barrier. And we, we hope that the contents of TPP uh, have the, those uh, high standards, uh, uh, although we, we, we are not very much informed of the exact contents. Now, uh, strategic meaning of the TPP has um, been emphasized by two previous speakers in the panel, is that um, uh, it sets a high standard, it sets the region of very strong economies, and this will probably uh, stand up to, in a sense, to, to Chinese uh, big markets, uh, so that uh, this will promote, as I mentioned, the bilateral uh, bilateral dependence, uh, and um, uh, that will lead to uh, more peace uh, uh, in in the region. Now, uh, uh, in Japan, there was argument that uh, TPP may not be good, and Japan should go for the ASEAN plus three uh, FDA. Uh, but I think that that, uh, that is uh, a, mis, uh, a misguided uh, uh, argument that I think that Japan both, uh, Japan needs both TPP and ASEAN plus three later. And um, uh, there was also misguided arguments that you know, uh, uh, TPP is bad for WTO. That's not the case. Again, as, as I mentioned, it's a building block of um, uh, WTO. Now, um, there, was argument, there is an argument in the US, um, actually some of my colleagues at Columbia are arguing that TPP is bad because TPP is to, uh, to export uh, US vested interests of bad institutions. And I'm, I'm not going to, into the details, but I think that's, uh, uh, that, that should be clarified and, and um, uh, rebutted. Uh, but to rebut, it, it is very important to keep, again, the TPP as clean and high standard. And um, uh, Japanese agricultural interest should be uh, should be uh, restrained, and U.S. Uh, some of the vested interests um, uh, of partic particular industries should be uh, should be restrained, and uh, we, we know that um, uh, uh, all other countries want the U.S. to U.S. Congress to pass TPA first, so that we can conclude TPP. So uh, passing TPA without conditions uh, would be very very important. Um, now the um, uh, so I I fully agree with the previous speakers that TPP has very strong strategic uh, importance both from econo economic uh, uh, interests and also security uh, uh, interests. Um, Next, the AIB, which um, uh, Senator Luger uh, uh, touched upon, and um, um, uh, this Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank idea was floated by China uh, back in October 2013. Nobody paid too much attention to it because it was such a horrendous idea that uh, uh, China will have the headquarter and president, and 50% of the voting share. Uh, can't be international organization. Uh, uh. Now, after that, then China modified the proposal uh, uh, and uh, tried to, try to uh, get the um, uh, participants. So they set the rule, and they asked for the uh, participation. And 
uh, surprisingly, I would say, uh, uh, when uh, they uh, closed the uh, um, uh, charter membership at the end of March uh, this year, that more than 50 uh, countries uh, signed up. And the most, su most surprising part was that the UK, Germany, France, and Italy signed up for those, this charter membership. And uh, we thought that uh, G7 had a, had a, uh, a united line that uh, they, the uh, G7 countries will wait and see uh, uh, how the um, uh, uh, institutions will be uh, uh, structured. Uh, because there are so many problems with the uh, ideas of this uh, AIIP. And since we're running out of time, so I'm not going into the details, but um, uh, like board membership, board, um, how, the, how the board will decide on the projects, how the board is set up, whether it's a resident board or a non-resident board, um, and conflict of interest issues uh, in the environment. So um, if you're interested, um, um, uh, please read my column, which will be uh, published soon. And um, uh, so um, uh, this will be a challenge to the international financial architecture, uh, as uh, alluded to by previous speakers. And I hope the, um, uh, this will be dealt with in uh, uh, appropriate uh, uh, manner to, um, and um, again, the US here, the US passing the IMF quota revision uh, uh, legislation will be very uh, important because that has been used um, as an excuse by China to set up this AIIB. It's like an um, UNCLOS uh, thing which was talked about uh, in earlier uh, sessions. And I hope the US and Japan uh, are united to uh, demand the uh, correct uh, uh, architecture of this new uh, bank and try to influence on the contents of this AIB. Thank you. Thank you, Taka. Um, I, I want to take advantage of this panel and, and pose a couple questions to the group. But let me just clarify going forward that I, I think, though Taka had to cut off on time, I think those of us in the economics part of the, prof of the game of US, Japan, and broader US foreign economic policy, the message we would like to get across to you reinforces the message given by Senators, Senator Luger and Dr. Flournoy, which is there is a building perception of US falling behind on leadership in the economic sphere. And this is very parallel to what Michelle said earlier about a self-fulfilling myth of decline, even though on the facts there's no decline. The U.S. Unwilling, Congress unwillingness to make the IMF reform, to make such a tantrum over AIB and make it into something bigger than it was, to be paltry with aid and, and various other aspects, this is reinforcing this narrative that the U.S. is scared to act. And of course, the TPP part of it that was raised just takes that to a whole nother level. So from the economic side, we would, we would reinforce that. Um, so picking up on that, what, what I'd like to do is just sort of press each of our panelists for a moment on, you've made this case. I am hoping and presuming that Prime Minister Abe will make this case as part of his remarks to, to the Congress. What in terms of selling individual US Congress people, senators, or diet members do you want to say next? I mean, what, what, is, what is the piece of this you think you can drive home to them? I'm not asking you to pass out the good pork, okay? That's, that's somebody else's job. But if, you, but if you can make an appeal to a Rob Portman who clearly is just running scared of re-election in Ohio and is selling out his principles, to be blunt, um, what do you say to somebody like that? Where do we go from here? Senator Luger? I think it's strictly a matter of patriotism the fact that, as we've all stressed, the United States leadership is at stake. And the failure to be a part of this would be to fall by the wayside. With uh, China leading uh, with this new bank, uh, or others really picking up the, the strains, while we continue to have our internal arguments over who is responsible for job loss and how other countries are unfair and so forth, this is really a, a critical moment in terms of 
peace and security in the world because the United States is going to play a role in any event in the security of our allies. But uh, this gives us a big opportunity uh, to do something to reinforce the jobs and the economic betterment of our own country while we're playing that role and to do so within the framework of TPP, and we didn't really get into all of the aspects that really respect human rights, respect <coughs> fairness, and, and good judgment in business policy. These are, cannot be taken for granted in other treaties. And uh, this is why our ideals, in addition to our leadership, would be reinforced. Thank you. Michelle? I, I think part of what needs to be done is we need to paint a very vivid picture of what failure mm -hmm. to pass, to, to conclude TPP looks like in terms of the imp longer term impacts on the U.S. standing in the region, our strategic interests in the region, and our own economy um, given, given the interaction with Asia. And so really, you know, drawing that picture in detail for people um, to help them see what's at stake at a strategic level. I also think we have to think about ways to provide political top cover for you know, members, particularly Democrats, who may be under pressure from unions or from other uh, constituencies um, who, you know, you know ha are, as I said, are under pressure and yet who see the strategic case and want to do the right thing. I think you know, one of the things that I think you can expect to see in the coming week or two is a series of open letters from former defense officials, former national security officials, making this case and, and trying to provide that political top cover for um, members who want to do the right thing but feel like they need you know, someone helping them make the case. Taka, in Japan, similarly, you've got the agriculture drive in the right. LDP. How do you get past that? Well, um, I think Prime Minister Abe has been clear that uh, he wants to reform the ag agricultural sector and make it stronger. So it's a domestic reform is, uh, is top on uh, his agenda. And that if he succeeds on that, uh, that will help this TPP negotiation. And I, th I think that has been the case. But again, I fully agree with Michelle that um, uh, uh, they need a political top cover. If uh, Mr. Prime Minister Abe says, I will take a responsibility and I sign this, but I will make the uh, uh, sector stronger by reform, then I think that that will go through. Let me now turn it around, perhaps more relevantly for this audience, but certainly of at least as much importance. If we go forward with TPP, we're looking, you know, we have at the moment among the 12 countries really sort of the key one in a sense is Vietnam as one that's rising and can benefit a lot. But we also have just on the cusp Philippines and Indonesia that were in, got out, were about to come in. How do you see this playing out? I mean, can't, is, there, is there aspects of this strategically that, that we should be pursuing? I mean, where do you see both for good and for ill our ability to pull along Indonesia and um, Philippines or others in Asia in this context. And maybe I could do it in reverse order and start with Taka. I, I, I think it's very important to um, have this TPP uh, open to those countries who want to join, who are to uh, clear this high standard. But admittedly, those in Indonesia and Philippines have a long way to go to, to, the, uh, to, to the high standard. So possibly we could have the two speed uh, that uh, first uh, tier countries and, and those who come later, who, who, which, you know, allowed, which are allowed to have 20 years instead of 10 years to achieve uh, those high standards. So I think it should be more inclusive uh, of those countries. Strategically, Michelle, I mean, how does this play into the kind of Indonesia and Philippines experience the senator was talking about? No, I, I agree that we want to have uh, an open door uh, for TPP. And I think part of our bilateral relationship, can we be working with both countries to try to get them on a path to achieve you know, a higher standard, you know, be able to 
comply with a higher standards uh, framework. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice parallel to the kind of capacity building work we want to be doing with them on the security side, um, where we're building common uh, frameworks for monitoring the environment, for um, trying to create cap capabilities that, for them to defend their own sovereignty and interests and territory, and then also be able to contribute to collective defense when there are threats in the region. So there's an, a very nice parallel between sort of um, trying to get them on a path to be able to join the T a TPP-like framework uh, while we're also working with them on the security side to build their capacity to contribute more to the, the security of the region. Senator Luger, if I could just follow up on that with you. In, in your career, you've seen other instances where the U.S. has reached out and integrated emerging, what we, they didn't used to call them that, they called them developing countries, but emerging markets, and sort of pulled them along. Korea, in a sense, would be an example of that. I mean, do, do you see this as a, as, a, as a model that can go forward, or do you, do you, are there things we need to think differently about in terms of those kinds of capacity building, integrating these, these future allies with us? I think we're already on that path, and it's a logical path for us uh, to pursue with countries that uh, are cooperating with that, really want our help, uh, so long as we do not appear to be uh, domineering and so forth. I'd just like to add, however, one more membership thought, and that is China itself. Mm -hmm. um, it, the door will be open. And um, the importance of uh, adopting TPP and then inviting China is that uh, TPP does have the proper framework in terms of, at least we believe, the right way to conduct trade, the right way to treat people, and so forth. And uh, the, the Chinese, uh, bank may not. Um, and, and so China would be really entering um, our sphere, at least, uh, which I, we believe is a more elevated one, while we are busy helping other countries, such as the Philippines or Indonesia or others, come along. And, and we could finally have quite a good membership in TPP. And I think that aspect hasn't been discussed. The list of the 12 is sometimes given, and many people are uh, surprised that, see who the 12 are, as a matter of fact. No, no, but I think this is really important. In fact, you unsurprisingly anticipated my next question, which is potential for China joining, and in fact, to be fair to some pieces of the Chinese government, on the last year, year and a half on TPP, they've actually been careful to not be as confrontational about this as they have been on some other issues. Um, but so let me, let me pursue that a bit more and, and turn to Michelle first. Um, you know, a lot of selling TPP in U.S. and in Japan has been, a, has at times taken on an anti-China feel. Now, there is a reasonable case, as you all have made, to say we want to make sure that leadership stays with the U.S. and its allies, that we want there to be an option for countries other than China. But that's not the same as some people say, and as the Chinese occasionally have in the past have tried to portray it, a strategy to encircle China. How, how do you think both U.S. and Japanese governments should go about navigating that sort of rhetoric or that sort of goal, that you, you want to be providing alternatives to China, but at least I, I, my impression is we don't want this to be a containment policy, but maybe I'm wrong. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, I don't think the notion of containment applies in Ch to China, given our, our interests, given our economic independence, given a whole variety of factors. Um, I, you know, I think that, in principle, TPP should be open to any country that is willing to implement the high standards of the framework. Um, I think the door should remain open to uh, all countries in the region, including China. I think we should be realistic about China's interest and ability to meet those standards um, any time soon, but, but I think the door should be open. Um, I also think as a matter of sort of how we position this. I think we were, if we were to close the door, it would just fuel Chinese efforts to come up with you know, other alternatives based on other rules and, and so forth. And I think it would defeat part of the diplomatic purpose of, of what we're doing. Um, so I, you know, I think 
uh, I don't know that we'll ever be successful in convincing Beijing that our policy is not one of containment. I spent a lot of time with my military counterparts showing them what containment of the Soviet Union looked like versus what our posture is today, trying to convince yeah. them. We may never convince them of that, even though it's true. Um, but we should be clear with ourselves about what we are and are not doing. Um, and it's, it's not possible to contain China. It's not in our interest to contain China. That is not a good description of what we are doing. Um, what we are trying to do is integrate into China into uh, a rules-based order that reflects these high standards and the interests and values that we share with our key allies and partners. Um, and when they don't do that and try to create alternatives, we need to try to counterbalance those. Uh, yeah. Taka, is there anything you want to add on that topic? Yeah, well, exactly. I, I fully agree with what Michelle has just said, adding with just one point that um, uh, in the Cold War, it was two separate economies, right? Uh, but you know, in, in, in this case, China is well integrated already yeah. into the economic uh, uh, parts, and we trade with China, and so it's, it's uh, almost impossible to contain, quote unquote, uh, in the sense of a Cold War. So mutual dependence and promoting peace is the only way we can go forward. In that sense, I think TPP should be open and we, we go for the more mutually dependent economies, which would be good for the security, too. Thank you. Before I open up the floor, one last question, again, starting with Senator Luger. Um, part of what I think President Obama has implied, and I certainly would say, is at the moment, if we are not successful in delivering TPP, we don't really have a good option B for the non-military outreach to the region. We don't have a big ticket program. I mean, obviously there are things, direct exchanges, commerce, and so on. Is that fair? Is that something we should be worried about if it is true? Yes, we should be worried about it uh, for some time. And uh, Michelle would know a great deal about this from her work in the administration. Uh, a lot of uh, congressional money for foreign aid, in quotes, has dried up. Various programs have gone by the wayside. And so as a result, although we do care a great deal, and when humanitarian crises come, we try to appropriate money rapidly uh, to try to help people. But in terms of a systemic way of working with countries around the world uh, to better their situations so they could deal better with us, uh, we, we are lacking, and this really is a thrust forward, but it's very important. I'm, I'm glad we had the discussion about China because China's rate of growth may be declining. Uh, that's not something for us to rejoice about. The, the rest of the world has prospered with a great deal of Chinese commerce coming and going. Now, the rules of the game need to be there so that uh, people are not disadvantaged unfairly, but um, we, we need to try to keep all the ships rising. Well, unless my colleagues want to add anything, let me open it up to the floor. We have just a few minutes left to stay on schedule. Please uh, raise your hand, and I, if I call on you over there, a microphone. Somebody just had their hand up. A uh, microphone's coming your way. If you could identify yourself, please, before asking a question. I'm Hiroshi Takeuchi um, at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Um, my question is, um, I, I start, uh, starting with uh, picking up one of the points that Dr. Ito mentioned but didn't mention much, that is the opposition from his colleague, uh, Dr. Joseph Stiglitz, to the TPP. And uh, so uh, he and also uh, Paul Krugman uh, oppose TPP a lot. And then my understanding is he, they are very frustrated with the lack of um, social welfare uh, network uh, uh, for um, the losers of the free trade. Um, standard way of um, managing the opposition and uh, building the support for free trade is uh, compensating losers by establishing social welfare policy for um, of the, um, um, to uphold the losers of the free trade and globalization. But social welfare policy and education policy right now are very divisive issue in American domestic politics. What is the prospect right now 
uh, for uh, establishing the social security net uh, for the losers of uh, free trade, globalization, and TPP? Um, maybe if Taka will allow me, I'll take that since that's actually about U.S. response. Um, so let, let's, ju let's just start with the basic facts. In the spirit of what Senator Luger said, um, there is a meanness in Congress, very much on the Republican side, but, uh, but throughout the Congress, uh, towards social welfare spending. And this shows up directly in trade adjustment assistance. So when trade adjustment assistance was passed in the late 70s, early 80s, to get the Tokyo round through, it was, I believe, 10 times larger in real terms than what is currently on the table to accompany TPP today. Um, and, and so just the miserliness and the hypocrisy of people on both sides of the aisle who say they're concerned about job loss and displacement to be unwilling even to support what is a very small but targeted program is stunning. And it would be nice if we call out members of Congress on that. Uh, Senator Wyden has put in some into the conference bill on TPA, but it's very small. But the second point is that the U.S., this, this, it is a strange thing, whether it's Joe Stiglitz or Paul Krugman or Richard Trumka, for that matter, to suggest that because the U.S. fails to provide a social welfare state comparable to any other rich country in general, we should block trade. It, it's like, it's like a, the child who doesn't get what they want throws a tantrum and refuses to take out the garbage. You know, this is, this is a, the, the failings as we're seeing right now in Baltimore and elsewhere in this country of, of economic safe security are 95% about domestic failures and lack of domestic will. And the left seems to keep wanting to take trade hostage. And as Barney Frank said at a speech at our institute two years ago, that strategy has failed. And it has costs in the strategic sense and the economic sense. So uh, Joe Stiglitz is just fundamentally wrong And if you on this issue. And if you go back to Paul Krugman's remarks at the National Association of Business Economists in March on TPP, he actually, I still think he gets stuff wrong, but he actually admits it's not really going to harm anybody in the US. So I think it's going to benefit people. But anyway, he's at least admitting it's not going to harm. So you're on a very important point, but it's crazy that in the US, the only time we get worried about social welfare benefits is when trade's at stake. It's just strange. Uh, another question, and then we'll call it time. Please, over there, and preferably one that the colleagues can answer. Hello, my name is Grace Clegg, and I'm at the East West Center. I have a question for Ito Sensei. Um, I have a quote here. You said that you believe that the TPP can stand up to the Chinese markets. And I was wondering if I could tease out a little bit what you meant by that. Are you inferring that the TPP block would be an alternative market for trade, or rather that by setting these rules of the road, it will induce the TP, I'm sorry, induce the Chinese markets to try to live up to the same standards if they want to trade with those who are members? And I just, to warn everybody, that will be the last question to keep on schedule. So, Taka, okay. you get the last so, word. So, um, I meant that both ways, that uh, if the TPP has a market, uh, size of the markets is bigger with the uh, US and Japan uh, combined, and with playing with the same rule, then uh, um, I think that, that will present the uh, Chinese to, uh, to honor those uh, large market rules uh, when they export uh, and import. And uh, that, that would be a sort, sort of the uh, counter, counterbalance to the Chinese argument that you know, they, they have the rule in China that should be observed by all the uh, foreign uh, invest, investors uh, uh, in China. And so the volume will make that you know, high standard uh, uh, to stick. That's what I meant. Terrific. Thank you for that clear and concise response. Please join me in thanking Professor Takatoshi Ito, the Honorable Michelle Flournoy, and of course, Senator Richard Luger.